Thank you, Nina. Good morning, church. God is good. All the time. God is good. Yay. And God is with us. Emmanuel. Stand and sing as we praise Jesus today. in our soul never lets us go. Please be seated. My name is Garrett Hope. I'm the director of worship here at First Covenant, and we are so glad that you're worshiping with us today. Uh, for our visitors, uh, please feel welcome. We've got some goodies for you back at the welcome bar, uh, journal and stickers and other swag and stuff like that, because we do that here, right? Today, Sunday school will happen for all ages. The adults will be in the cafe, the middle schoolers will be doing confirmation in the chapel, and our youth will be downstairs. And today will be the last day of Sunday school for about a month as we take a break for the holidays. We will resume Sunday school mid-January. Christmas Eve is on the 24th. Wait, that's weird. It's always on the 24th. <laughs> Christmas Eve is on a Sunday this year. That's what I meant to say. So we will have a service in the morning and a service in the evening, and you are invited to come. And the evening service is at 6 o'clock, and it's a 
child-friendly service and lots of involvement. It's participatory, so please bring your families. It'll be a joyful time. Um, Advent is my second favorite season of the year. I think Lent is my first favorite season of the year. <laughs> but Advent reminds us of why we need Lent. Advent reminds us, it points us to the person who's coming, who's going to do the work. And that fills me with joy. Because I desperately need some saving. And I need some help. And we all do. And that's what we're doing here today, is we remember why we gather. So this time I'd like to invite the Andersons down to light our Advent candle to help us continue to remember. Today we, today we light the Advent candle of joy. We often mix happiness and joy. Happiness is temporarily and usually influenced by our circumstances. Joy is like an internal battery. True joy filled, is filled by God and animates us, us sometimes in spite of our circumstances. Concerning the source of our joy, in the mid-1700s, Jonathan Edwards wrote, God is the highest good of the reasonable creature, and the enjoyment of him is the only happiness in which our souls can be satisfied. To go to heaven fully to enjoy God is infinitely better than the most pleasant accommodations here. Fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, or children, or the company of earthly friends are but shadows. But the enjoyment of God joy comes from the Lord, we are encouraged to exercise our joyfulness individually and together. As Paul instructs in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-24, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who called you is faithful, and he will do it. May joy of the Lord be our strength. Today, as we light the ambient candles of hope, peace, and joy.
please stand and sing with us as we continue.
Father, thank you for this great promise that you will come to us, that you are Emmanuel. And we rejoice, and we have no reason to be downcast. We have no reason to weep when we know that our Savior is coming. And we place our hope in you, and our joy comes from you, and our peace comes from you. That you are the good God, the God who loved us so much that you came to earth to become a man, knowing that you would have to die for our redemption. Thank you, Father. Please receive our gifts today, our gifts of prayer, the gifts of our time and our money. May we support each other. May we pray for those who are sick today. May you place your healing hand upon them. For those who are struggling, may they find their peace and their joy and their hope in you. In your name we pray, amen. At this time, I'd like to ask the ushers to come forward for to collect the offering. You may be seated. Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and my old sweet their songs repeat, a peace on earth.
I'd like to invite the kids up for the children's message. Matt, would you grab my little bag of goodies there? I forgot that. Or Paul? All right. Come on up, guys. Okay. Well, thank you for bringing that to me. All right. Come on up. All right. All right. I know my boys have watched a show on TV called Is It Cake? anybody else heard of this? Is it cake? Okay. So, we were going to, Everly, did you have a question? Or are you saying you know? Okay. So, we were going to play that game, is it cake? And I thought I would bake some cakes and see if you could tell. But the truth is, even if I tried to make a cake that looks like a cake, you probably wouldn't know it's a cake. <laughs> I'm not good at making cakes. So, we're going to do a little bit different. I got a bag of stuff here. And we're going to play, is it real? We'll see how good you guys are. Some of them will be easy. Some of them might be harder. Is this a real car? No? Okay. That's, that's not a real car. One for one. All right. Is this a real bouncy ball? No. Ooh, we got no's. We got yeses. That is a real bouncy ball. All right. Is this a real dog treat? No. no. That's from beef jerky. But my dogs do really <laughs> like it. All right. We've got a couple more here. <coughs> Maybe. All right. Is this real money? Yes. No. Yes, no. Sort of. There's, there's a few of them here. Some of them are and some of them aren't. Yeah. Oh. Huh. I'm holding on to that. There we go. All right. All right. A couple more. 
Is this a real bouncy ball? No? Yes? Oh, nope, that one's a marble. <laughs> All right, we have lots of bouncy balls. Is this a real bouncy ball? Yes, that's a real bouncy ball. All right, this one's kind of gross. My dogs like to trick me with this one. Is this a real piece of dog poop? No, it's a stick, but they leave it on the carpet and it looks like it. <laughs> All right, one more. You might have to look at this one. Is this real money? Is this real money? Yeah? No, it's not. It's from, all right, sit down, guys. You can, you can pass that around and look at it as, as long as you're paying attention. All right, I'll take the fake one back. You can keep the real one. Okay. That is real money. It's a gold dollar from the United States. You could take that to the store and spend it just like a real dollar. <laughs> well, thank you for the honesty, Marit. All right. So you had to look at that one, though. You had to look pretty close to tell, right? Some of these things were easy. Like that car was easy to tell if it was real or not. But some of them were a little bit more difficult, and you had to get close to it. You had to look at it and spend time with it and know it to know if it was real or not. I knew all these things before I even took them out of the bag because I've spent time with them. They're all from my house. So yeah, I had to go looking for things that I thought I might be a little tricky with and we found them. And so I know these things really well. So there's a story in the Bible and I think a lot of you guys know it. The disciples are out in the boat and it's windy and there's waves and they see somebody walking towards them on the water and they think oh my goodness it's a ghost and then they realize it's Jesus and then Peter walks on the water yeah yeah he sinks and he sinks and, and yes good job yeah and when they got out of the boat at the end, you know what the disciples said? The disciples said, you, Jesus, you really are the son of God. For sure, you are the real thing. You're not a fake. You don't have any questions about it. And they worshiped Jesus and they said, you are the son of God. So just like these things, sometimes we have to get close to something. We have to spend time with it. We have to get to know it to know if it's real. So I want you guys to get to know Jesus, to spend time in his word, to spend time in Sunday school, to listen to Bible stories, to pray, and to really get to know Jesus so that you guys can know for sure in your heart, just like I do, that yes, Jesus, you are real. You are for sure the son of God. Should we pray? Hey, God, thank you for all the myriad ways that you have shown us that you are the Son of God, both in the Bible and in our lives every day. We pray that that would become evident to us in new ways every day. Thank you so much for these kids. In your name, amen. All right, you can go sit down. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Evan. Glad to be with you this morning. Um, I love hearing the biblical literacy from the kids this morning. How about that? They knew the story real well. That's great. Good job, parents, on that. Um, I also wanted to clarify uh, from Garrett's announcements. This is my favorite part of the morning so far. It's not actually a bar in the back where the guests can go. <laughs> so maybe it's different Canada where you're going for Christmas break. I don't know, but... Anyways, um, I'm delighted to be with, here, with you here to open the Word of God. We're going to open to Matthew 14 this morning. We have a lot of scriptures, but we're going to start there, and we're going to end there, Matthew 14. 
We're going to hear exactly what they're referencing, Jesus walking on the water. We're looking for one key phrase in that as we read it. So we're going to read the whole thing, Matthew 14, 22 through 36. Here it goes. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because of the wind, or the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they landed in Gennesaret. And, then, and when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. This is the word of the Lord. If we look at verse 33, 32 and 33 are kind of the key verses I wanted us to focus on uh, today. We see two key things there in verse 33. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. I think there we can do a lot and focus our efforts this morning because we've been looking in this Advent season, these four weeks leading up to Christmas, at the, the names and titles that are, that are around Jesus, what he gets called. We run into these titles every year about this time. You know, Emmanuel, God with us, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, they're right there behind me on the board. God with us is Emmanuel, we talked about that. Um, we re- ta- last week we talked about Jesus, the Son of Man. He uses that title a lot for himself and other people apply that to him, but Jesus himself uses that a lot. This week we're looking at Son of God, which is right here in the text. They worshiped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. And I think we can do a a worthwhile investigation to ask the question, what did they think they were saying, and who is Jesus actually, and how did they kind of end up coming to that conclusion of who Jesus was actually? Because I think when they're in the boat, when they're worshiping him, it it might not look exactly like we think it looks. But I think the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they definitely want us to see something different. They definitely want to see something more than what's happening here in the boat. So what I want to look at as we consider the Son of God is I want to look at both the word worship here, and we'll start there, and then look at the title Son of God. And, and we'll keep moving forward with that, and we're going to make some heads or tails of this. So let's start with the issue of worship. They worshiped him in the boat. Now, in Scripture, all throughout Scripture, actually that word worship does get used with kind of different levels of meaning. But let's start with kind of God 101 by going to the the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. It'll be on the screen. And we'll read the first two commandments. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. That's kind of the the basic, the baseline. Don't worship anything but God. And we hear that pretty clearly. Don't make an image of anything and try and worship it, whether it's trying to make an image of God or trying to make an image of something else that would be a false God, not real. An idol, that's really what idol means. And of course, if, if we read a little further in Exodus, you realize that while they're receiving, Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments, what are the people down below Mount Sinai doing? Uh, Aaron says, I was swayed by the crowds, and we melted down all our earrings and made a golden calf and worshipped it as God, or as a God. And uh, then there's a lot of death that ensues from that because they did wrong. And it's not like they were ignorant of that fact, even though the Ten Commandments were on the mountain. They, they had a clue on this one. 
worshiping God alone matters. That's kind of God 101. But we do see that the word gets employed in Scripture in a couple different ways. And that's important for us to recognize here. So we go to the, when we focus on the Christmas story, we hear about the wise men. Uh, Matthew 2, uh, we'll read verse 2 and verse 11, because there the word gets employed in a particular way. The wise men come to Herod. They ask him, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And then verse 11 says, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented them with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so we do run into this term in Scripture. In the Old Testament, we run into it. And in the New Testament, even a place like this, where it's not worship in that first and second commandment sense. It's really more paying homage like, as to a king. And I wondered this because I looked at this. Well, what does that practically look like? And we can see images of that throughout Scripture of hugs, kisses, whether kisses on the cheek, the mouth, the ring. That's sometimes how it would happen. Um, they would show honor by bowing. We see that in the text, kneeling before someone. Even you see in Scripture people prostrating themselves completely in front of somebody um, as a way of honoring, uh, speaking words of praise, or here, gift-giving. So it, it gets employed in different ways, and I think that's important to recognize. But then, of course, the opposite of that is like the Exodus 20, the first and second commandment way, where we see it in all over the book of Revelation. I'll just pick Revelation 19.10. Uh, that tells us, reminds us of an important point. Uh, John is standing there with an angel, and it says, uh, John says, at this I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Right? So there you see a completely different way. That's the the other side of it, the, the way that we come on Sunday, for instance, to worship God. Right? Not just to pay homage to God as a king, but as the rightful creator, sustainer, redeemer, the one who deserves our praise and honor. And so there's different types of worship employed there. And so I think that's important when we then come to what the disciples are doing in the boat, to ask a few questions. But I want to leave us with with sort of an important principle here. Even though it's used in different ways, when it comes to actually true worship, the way we employ the word, only God is worthy of our worship. That's the important scriptural principle we need to take away from this, and we'll do something more with that in a moment. Now, when we look back at at the text, and we see them worshiping in the boat, I think we have to make a distinction between what we hear today, as those living in the 21st century who have read or kind of know the story, and those disciples who are in the boat who are experiencing Jesus firsthand. What we hear today sometimes is something like when Matthew... uh, uh, recounts Jesus being baptized in Matthew three seventeen, We hear these words, uh, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. When Jesus, get bap- Jesus is baptized. And because we're on the other side of the story, and we're on this far down the line on history, some of us here, full-blown Trinitarian, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this is the second person of the Trinity who's right there, God in the human body, and we assume God incarnate, those kinds of things. Which is who Jesus was and is. It's all accurate and correct, because we're on this side of history and we know all of that. But the disciples in the boat, we have to ask, did they know that yet? Did they know that yet when they were standing there and it says they worshipped him and called him the Son of God? What did the disciples see and hear and experience at that time? And we get a real glimpse of what they understood just two chapters later, when Peter makes his famous confession. When Jesus asked the disciples, you know, who do others say that I am? And they say, you know, Elijah, prophet, all these things. They don't say the Son of God. Then they say, who do you say that I am? And Peter makes this confession in in Matthew 16, 16. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So we know kind of what they meant at that point. He's not saying, you're God in a human body. Now Jesus is, but he's not saying that yet. He hasn't figured it out yet. Peter's saying, you're, you're like, you're the sent one, the one in the line of David who is going to come and save Israel. We're not even going to get into what they thought that meant, but to save Israel and to put us back on track with this sort of uh, leadership that we had in the line of David. You're that one. 
That's what he's saying. And, and we know that in, in the Old Testament, others were called sons of God. We even see it in the New Testament a little bit. Israel is called a son of God. Uh, Adam, even. We find others. So that word can be slippery and employed in different ways. I think it's, it's hard to get to grips. Son of man is really easy, I think, to figure out the divinity of Jesus. Son of God gets used. So many different understandings come into play in so many different heads. You're the Messiah, the Son of God. Okay, that seems to be what Peter understands. And that doesn't leave us nowhere, by the way, to acknowledge those things. I think it's really important, actually, to acknowledge what the disciples understood then and the conclusions that they eventually came to about the reality of Jesus. Because those are different things. And I say that because they discovered who Jesus really was by walking with him. They didn't figure it out here in the boat, but they figured out a lot. But by the end, they figured out who he really is. By the end, his, he's fully revealed to them, and they get it. They get who he is. And what's interesting is that the disciples on the other side put together things like the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so that we'll get it, so that we'll understand it, so that we'll come to the right conclusions, right? They might not have known the fullness of who Jesus was until he finally rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, and they're like, ah, now we get it. Now we understand. They figured it out, though. But in the Gospels, they say, they, they walk us along and they say, now you watch us figure it out. You get to sit above all of this and look at us in the boat and be like, no, he's more than that. Come on, can't you see that, disciples? He's more. He's fully human, fully God, fully human. He's God incarnate, come to save you. God in the human body. They get it, and they're saying, you should get it too. That's why we're writing this down. That's why we're putting this together in this way so you can walk with us and see what we discovered. Because it took us a while to get it but we want you to get it too. This is that important. And so you look at something like the Gospel of John. You know, John 1, starting at verses 1 and 2, where John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's talking about Jesus. He was with God in the beginning. He gets more clear in verse 18. He says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in close, closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So John's telling us in his gospel, Jesus is God. You should pay attention to everything that he does, because that's what this is all pointing towards. Jesus is God, and he wants us to see it right away, so that we don't have to take all the time the disciples took to conclude that. We can see it, and we can discover what that looks like. John, if we turn back to him again, he says something, again, that's worth noting in John 3.16 and John 18. Those two verses where he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And verse 18 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And, and the word, uh, some translations have begotten there instead of one and only, um, but one and only is a better direction to take it um, because it's really the term means unique or incomparable. He's not like other sons. He's not like other people who are around. He's something different in quality and character and in purpose and all of these things. It's not really talking about the relationship as much or even where he comes from as much as what he's supposed to do. He's a different kind of human son. And he was God, John tells us. And you should notice this. You should notice these things as you read what we're telling you about Jesus. That's what the gospel writers are telling us. And so it comes down to, as we said earlier, then uh, only God deserves our worship. But if Jesus is God, guess what? He deserves our worship, doesn't he? He deserves our, our true worship. And so if we turn back to Matthew 14, we can make some heads or tails of this. Again, how the gospel writers, in this case, how Matthew presents it to us, matters to get the bigger picture so that we get the conclusion faster than the disciples did. Because what's interesting is if you look at Matthew 14, 1, it won't come up on the screen, but I'll read it to you because it's about Herod, who's sort of, he's a, a ruler in the area, uh, sort of half Jewish, and not, not really religious in any way, in any real way. Um, and it says, at that time, Herod, the Tetrarch, heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, this is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. That's why miraculous powers are at work in him. Right, so he had had John the Baptist killed, even though he liked John. Those two things usually don't go together. You don't kill someone you like. He liked John. He killed him. And you can read the story right after that. 
Um, but then he says, no, no, this, this, he, he first of all believes that some power, whether God or not, could bring someone back to, from the dead. That's a big belief. And then he's like, and this, is, this Jesus must be John, brought back from the dead. And he's doing these miraculous things. And he believed all this stuff. So Herod the unbeliever, Herod the bad guy in the story, believes. Isn't that interesting? And then you compare that, and this is what the gospel writers do for us, so we'll get the point. Herod the bad guy believes, and the next story that we see in, in Matthew 14 is that Jesus feeds the 5,000. He's standing there, he's teaching on the hill, and then the disciples say, hey, it's getting late, let's send everybody home so they can get some, or at least send them out to get something to eat, one or the other. And Jesus says, you feed them. And the disciples are like, well, but we have five loaves and two fish. What are we going to do here? And Jesus says, bring them to me. And then they bring back 12 basketfuls of leftovers because Jesus multiplies this. See how that's con contrasted with the bad guy gets the power of God in some way. And the good guys in the story are like, well, how are we going to do this? There's a mir miraculous power isn't going to work. What? We don't have food. They don't, they don't quite get it. And then it goes further when Jesus walks on the water and they're scared. And Peter, at least, let's give Peter credit. He's the one that steps out of the boat. Think to yourself, would I be Peter or one of the other disciples in that case? Right? Peter gets out of the boat. But then Jesus says, you have little faith. And I think it's playful. I don't think it's just like pointing the finger. But you see it's contrasted then by the very end where they go to a Gentile region and people are pulling people in all over the place because this guy heals. We believe. And so you have this sort of contrast of the bad guy gets it, the Gentiles get it, but the people who are pulled in closest to Jesus are like, wait, who is this guy? What's this guy doing? Can he really do this? He did it before, but can he do it again? And we're supposed to catch on to this faster than the disciples. That's not to discredit the disciples. It's just to, to realize that they were at every turn forced to rethink what they thought about Jesus. At every turn, they had to keep rethinking it. Who is this guy? Is he just the, the, the Messiah? Is he the Son of God like we were thinking in the Old Testament? Is he just a, a, someone like a king that we would pay homage to and worship? Or is he something more? Right? And the belief grows with time, but it also grows with evidence. And they keep getting more of this evidence. The gospel writers present us with that evidence too. They present us with this evidence of who Jesus is. They show us the experience of the disciples, when they get it and when they don't, so that we would benefit and we would get it. They show us the experience of unbelievers, when they get it, so that we will get it. They show us the presentation of Jesus within the Gospels, when he, uh, the one who's described as wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, the Son of God, the Son of Man. So we'll start to fill in those titles with meaning and understand who he really is. They keep showing us when he heals. They keep showing us when he releases people from bondage, from demons. They keep showing us when he touches someone or cares for someone or speaks the words of truth. They show us when he dies and when he rises again. They show us everything that Jesus is doing. And they show us that the disciples are forced to rethink Jesus at every turn. So they finally come to the conclusion that this is God in a human body come to save us. And we should come to the same conclusion. That's what they're telling us. They're telling us this is what we figured out and you should come to this too. And so it struck me as a question that's, that's worth us thinking about, is when was the last time you were forced to think, rethink, or reevaluate your relationship with Jesus? When was the last time you did that to sort of advance our understanding, your understanding of who he is, to follow him better? And as I was considering that this week, I just for throwback sake and because it relates to this I was reminded of the most famous C.S. Lewis quote that's always worth quoting in cases like this when we're talking about the son of God and is he really the son of God who does he say he is you know Lewis in mere Christianity uh, famously said I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher but I don't accept his claim to be God that's the one thing we must not say a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. 
but let us not come with some patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And as you consider your response to Jesus, consider the people that we've already run into along the way in our journey this morning. The wise men come to Jesus and they worship him as a human king. Baby, but a human king. They recognize there's something more. And maybe that's all you've got this morning. You come to Jesus and you say, okay, I can, I can get there. I can see that there's something to Jesus. More than just regular human, there's something there. And I would say, if you find yourself there, stick there and work forward from there, but don't go back. That's a start. Okay, I can start by paying homage in some way. Some of us uh, find ourselves more in the position like the rabbis, or like the, not rabbis, like the disciples in the boat. That'd be funny. But like the disciples in the boat, they see Jesus as a rabbi, or revered rabbi, as maybe the one in David's line, God-sanctioned prophet. And so they do pay homage to him, they, pay, they worship him, but not in the sense of the first and second commandment, not in the sense of the angels speaking in Revelation. And maybe you find yourself there this morning with Jesus. You're there. Okay, stay there. Don't go back. Go forward from there. But maybe you find yourself like the disciples after the resurrection. The light bulb goes on. They realize who this Jesus really is. The disciples see Jesus for who he is, God in the human body sent to rescue the world and establish God's kingdom. And their response, they worshiped him at that point. They figured it out and they worshiped him in that first and second uh, uh, commandment sense. If you find yourself there today, that's the response the gospel writers want from us. That's what they're saying Jesus deserves. He deserves our worship and our praise. And let me end with this from 1 John 5. John writes, We know also that the Son of God has come and given us understanding. Let's pray for that this morning. God, give us understanding of who your Son is, so that we may know him who is true. We are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Let's pray together. Lord, may we receive your son for who he really is. We recognize that it sometimes is a real journey to get there. And we also recognize that you walk with us on that journey. Your spirit is not removed from that, but your spirit is the one who guides us. So may we, in fact, first and foremost, be open to your spirit this morning, your Holy Spirit working in us and through us and next to us that would lead us to the reality that your son Jesus is fully God and fully human, come to save us. That, that in some mysterious and remarkable way, he not only does something that transforms us through his sacrifice and through the work of the Holy Spirit, but he also gives us an example of what we're supposed to be like. So we're transformed. We can see what we're supposed to be, but then we're given the power through the Holy Spirit to be transformed into that. Lord, may that power be in us. May that worship come out of us to glorify and honor your son, Jesus Christ, for who he really is today. Help us discover the reality of Jesus. Amen. This will be exciting.
how you feel about Jesus Christ. Do you believe his claim to be the Lord? And if you do, then you only have one choice, to worship him in truth and in holiness. Go in peace today.